Please welcome Dr. Desmond Ford. Every one of us here in this room and everybody outside this room is threatened by insecurity and insufficiency. There are no exceptions and there never will be in this life. Even Christians are under continual threat about both of these. Life is not a party. Life is a tremendous battle. We all have troubles. We all have trials. We all have losses and crosses. The worst of it is we all have sins. And sins bring more sorrows than God's darkest providences. And then we have questions. Why this? Why that? And a hundred other whys. Now you know why God invented preaching. The great privilege of the Christian preacher is to meet his brethren and sisters right where they are, deep in trouble. He has a word for them that can lift them high. He can assure them that God has spoken and have said all things, all things work together for good to those that love God. In other words, our ills are only hidden benedictions. Imagine saying to a man in deep trouble, did you know that the Father's presence encircled Christ and nothing befell him say that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. That was his source of comfort and it is for you and it is for me. Whoever is imbued with the spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Whatever comes to him comes from the Saviour who surrounds him with his presence. Nothing can touch him except by the Lord's permission. All our sorrows, all our sadness, all our trials and temptations, all our persecutions and privations, in short, all things work together for your good, for my good, if we know Christ. All experiences, all circumstances are God's workmen whereby good are brought to us. That's the privilege of the preacher, to speak against the seemings, against the feelings, and to point to the one who loves us infinitely and always, despite our blemishes, despite our sins, despite our failures. God is always for us. Now, as you know, Ellie has suggested we have a series on preaching and I want to very briefly review what we did two weeks ago, the first of our series, and then move into our topic, how to preach without notes. The messenger and the message, two most important elements in preaching. It doesn't matter what language you choose to employ, you can never say anything other than what you are. You remember that when St. Francis, Francis went preaching in a small town with one of his followers, Francis never opened his mouth. At the end of the town, the follower says, we didn't preach. Oh, yes, we did, St. Francis. 
We were preaching all the time we were walking through and everybody had their eyes fastened on you and me. Oh, yes, we were preaching. Your listeners will give you no more credit, your ideas, than they give you personally. The voice of Jacob is no good if the hands are the hands of Esau. When the pillar of fire went before Israel to the promised land and the star in the heavens led the wise men to Bethlehem, the significant thing was that the leaders did go ahead of them. They led the way. They travelled the course. They touched the hard stones and the mud. And the preacher must do that. The law in the Old Testament was there must always be a fire burning on the altar. And a man of God always has a fire burning within him, the fire of the Holy Spirit. And when he speaks, he should speak as a dying man to dying men, but he seems every inch alive because God is there, because the Holy Spirit lives in him. That's the privilege of the preacher. That's the privilege of preaching. It sounds tough. A dying man to dying men? Hey, that's factual. That's reality. That is truth. I am a dying man and you are dying people. And how much we need the gospel. How much we need it. God doesn't bless great talents. God blesses great likeness to Jesus. And the message, well, good, glad and merry tidings makes the heart to sing and the feet to dance. That's the message F.B. Meyer preached in Christchurch long ago and a man contemplating suicide paused at the door knowing something was going on in this building. What was it? Might as well find out before he cut his throat. And F.B. Meyer picked up a thread from the orchestra pit. He said, this violin thread will never sing again and your heart may be broken today. But God can put your heart together again and give you the sweetest music of the universe if you believe that he loves you, that he loves you infinitely, that he loves you today. And the man heard it, gave up his suicide intentions. Yes, the heart may be broken, but God can put it together and God can bring forth sweet music. However weak we are, however foolish we are, that's my comfort because I am a weak man. I am a foolish man. I make many mistakes, but I know the gospel and the gospel gives me hope. A famous European scholar said, whoever gives a person hope is giving them the biggest thing in the universe that they could receive. Hope, or well, hope comes through the gospel. To know that we're complete in Christ, that we're accepted in the beloved, that we don't have to be good to be saved, but we do have to be saved to be good. Knowing that he took our sins, that he paid the price. We care for no other knowledge in the world than this, that we have sinned and God has suffered. And God has taken our evil and given us his righteousness. That's the gospel. Now, preaching without notes. Well, it's like trying to kiss your beloved through a paling fence. Ever tried it? <laughs> when Peter stood up at Pentecost, you think he took out a big manuscript and began to read how these men had been responsible for putting the Messiah to death, full stop. No, no, you can't picture Peter reading a manuscript at Pentecost and our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are ye that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for you shall be filled. Did he read a manuscript? A manuscript creates a barrier between the congregation and the preacher. They say to themselves, if he can't remember it, why does he expect me to remember it? Well, how do you preach without notes? You've got to sweat over it. The talk I gave about two weeks ago cost me about 50 hours. Not one five, five zero. It's very costly to be a preacher. It's more difficult than being the President of the United States because he has thousands of people to help him. But if you're a preacher, you don't get a great deal of help as you wrestle with a theme without notes to present to people who have their eyes on you, who catch every mistake and who are saying, well, how does he live during the week? The first point is this, sweat over it. Live with your talk. Think about it when you're going to bed at night. Think about it as soon as you wake up. Think about it as you eat breakfast. Think about it as you're in the car or in the train. You think about your theme until you know your subject as well as you know the palm of your hand. And that'll take many hours. Know your subject like the palm of your hand. And one of the ways you get to know it is you write it out, not the whole lot, main ideas, main ideas. Because when you write something and see what you've written, it is more indelibly written on the mind. The more senses we can employ, the more indelibly the idea is riveted. So you should write out the main ideas one after another in succession and look at them and imagine that they are all written in fire. Then you must remember that the organisation of your talk will either make it difficult or easy and it will make it difficult or easy for your congregation. Your talk must be organised. You know, it makes all the difference how you serve a plate up to guests. If my wife is doing it, it looks dainty and appetising. If I do it, it looks like I stood back six feet and threw the food at the plate and then passed it on. Organisation makes all the difference. And the organisation can either be logical or psychological, but it must have an organisation that fits the mind and the experience of people. Now, here is the key idea in preaching without notes. If you miss this, go home without it. You've lost everything. You must make a nonsense sentence out of the main ideas in sequence. So if when you've written out your main ideas, you find there are naturally five divisions, five segments, you must fix on a word for each segment that sums it up. It may be, having heard Colin, that criticism might be one, you know. Why do you want to pull out the, the, the moat out of your brother's eye when there's a log in your own? But you must find a word for each section and then put the words in a sentence. Pharisees criticise. Christ loves and forgives. That would give you five divisions, you see. You must make a nonsense sentence of each word that summarises a section of your talk. And if you're still nervous, you can even guarantee the sequence. Fix on an idea that fits each number in one to ten. One, run. Two, zoo. Three, tree. Four, door. Five, hive. Six, sick. Sick. Seven, heaven. Eight, gate. 
nine wine, ten den of thieves. You picture your idea in a section of your sentence and make a picture out of that idea and tie it to the number. So if I'm going to talk about uh, a certain great Australian who was always present at the Olympics, if that's going to be section one in my talk, I picture him, one run, I picture him running at the Olympics and I picture Adolf Hitler nearby because it's 1933 and that's such a funny scene, Hitler and an Australian at the Olympics. Well, you know, the Germans did have a big athletic event about 1933. But you have to picture something that is crazy, that is nonsensical, so stupid is it, it'll stick in your mind. And you form a picture for each number, one run. So you've got this man running at the Olympics and Hitler frowning because he's an Australian, the runner. Two, zoo. The second part of your talk may have to be with a man that uh, loved to visit scenes of nature and particularly loved to visit zoos. So you picture that man walking around the zoo and patting the lions and the elephants and, and uh, saying good day to the alligators. And a stupid idea like that makes a picture you cannot forget. So the summary of preaching without notes is to make a nonsense sentence of the key words representing each word as segment of your talk. And secondly, if you want to make sure you've got the sequence right, you make pictures concerned with the numbers of one to ten. And when you make that picture, see it in blazing fire and you'll remember it. Much more to be said. If you're going to preach, make sure you're rested. I have been preaching now for 70 years. On occasion, I have rested on a bar top table in a room where people have been drinking alcohol and in half an hour they're going to come in and I'm going to preach. If I'm in a city which, which I'm not familiar, I've done this many, many times, I watch for a park on the way to the place where I'm going to preach, see if there's one near enough so that when people are having their lunch, I move out, I go to the park and I stretch out on the green grass for an hour and then I go back and preach again. If I can't find a park, there's always someone there I know, so I will say John or Jack or Bill or Jean, do you mind if I use the back seat of your car? I'm going to have a rest. And they're very happy to do that. But you must rest before you speak. You dare not let your vitality be watered down or rubbed off. You must be alive. If you want your audience to come to life, be alive. That means you must be rested. You must be rested. There's another practical point. Don't have a good meal before you preach. I had one today, but I tried to be temperate. My daughter gave me an excellent meal, but she always urges me to eat more than I should. <laughs> and I always have a battle saying, no, not now. You can't have the blood in your stomach and your head at the same time. You cannot preach well if you've just had a huge meal. All these things have to do with vitality. The preacher must be vital. Every inch of him must be alive. It must shout his message that God is in him, that God is speaking through him to you. Of course, the main thing that contributes to vitality is your general health. And we're one third born. You can't do much about that. We're one third made. You were brought up by two people that did the best for you but didn't know everything. But one third you make yourselves. And it's usually the casting vote how we choose in all our habits, day by day, month by month, how we eat. Let me tell you in one sentence all that's known about nutrition in a nutshell. Now, I've been studying nutrition since I was 10. I began to read books on nutrition at the age of 10. I didn't have a perfect inheritance, pretty good, I think, but not perfect. And uh, I wanted to be around for a while. 
Lord willing. So I began to read books on nutrition at the age of 10. But I'll tell you the whole essence of nutrition in one sentence. If you obey this sentence, you needn't read any more. Eat fresh, whole food, chiefly of vegetable origin. You got it? Never forget it. Eat fresh. What we get at the supermarket may be a month old. As soon as the lettuce is picked, it loses about half its value within a day or two. Fresh. Now, my conscience always pricks me when I say this because ideally I should be a gardener and you are looking at the worst gardener on the face of the earth. But the ideal would be to raise your own food to make sure you get it free. Fresh, whole food. What do we mean by whole? Well, we don't mean holy. We mean whole, not processed, not refined, not in a packet, a can or a pocket, a packet, unless there's some emergency. If I'm travelling, I'll... I may take a can of uh, lentils, but only a can that doesn't have uh, a poisonous lining inside it. I've forgotten the word. Bishamol? Bill, what is it? Bishamol? Hmm? Bishamol. Bishamol, something like that, isn't it? Anyway, that's a poisonous lining that's in many cans. It's in Nuttaline, something that I like very much, but I've written to the SHF and said, as a Christian firm, you should do what some non-Christian firms have done in America and remove their bisphenol, which is a poisonous thing. You have it in every can of Nuttaline, etc. So you avoid as much as possible processed foods because the main reason people die in the West isn't alcohol, though that kills multitudes. The main reason people die in the West is because we live on processed foods. All foods in packets, cans and bottles, I say all, there may be 1% exception. But once it's processed, it is somewhat dead and it will hasten your death. Eat fresh, whole food, unprocessed, chiefly of vegetarian origin. I recently had to go to a, a dental specialist. He said, well, you look pretty good. How do you do it? I said, three, day, three hours of exercise a day and I don't eat anything with a face. <laughs> <laughs> exercise, nothing with a face. Fresh, whole food, chiefly of vegetable origin. This means that many current popular foods come into question. I gave up dairy products in the 1970s, the more I learned about them. And I love cheese, but I have found that where, while I can abstain, I can't be temperate. So I have to treat cheese the way I treat chocolate. I can abstain, but I can't be temperate. <laughs> but it is what you do habitually that counts. It's not what you do now and again. It's what you do habitually that counts. Okay, that's food, health. You are what you eat. That's true. You are what you eat, except some people by inheritance have things slanted against them. Exercise. Most of the literature says do half an hour a day. That is ridiculous. <laughs> that is absolutely ridiculous. Our ancestors spent 12 hours a day out there toiling in the fields, sunshine there for about eight hours or so, but 12 hours out there in the open air. The idea that 30 minutes exercise is enough and to sit on our backside the rest of the day will suffice, that is sheer stupidity and ignorance. More recent literature on exercise commends at least one hour a day of vigorous exercise. One of the greatest authors of the last century was Will Durant. I've read a lot of Will Durant's material. Not a Christian, but a very decent man. When he had health problems, he went to a doctor and the doctor said, well, this is what you're to do. You're a scholar. Every hour you study, you must stop. Five minutes for the end, throw your books away, get up, move around. Every hour. As well as that, swing the axe or do something vigorous physically for at least one hour a day. Will Durant lived into his 90s. His mind was clear to the last. So exercise. And don't be fooled by these stupid articles that try to tell you you can sit on your backside most of the time and lie in your bed and just give 30 minutes to chance by moving around. That's ridiculous. 
And if you find that television has a great fascination for you, at least get up when the ads come on <laughs> and circle the room. It's not a good thing to sit for more than half an hour at a time. You must get up, even if it's only for two or three minutes. You must move around. Perfect health depends on perfect circulation. Perfect circulation largely depends on how active you choose to be. So much for exercise. Fresh air. Listen, Spurgeon said the next best thing to the grace of God is oxygen. He gave his ushers, his deacons, implicit instructions. When he was to go to preach at a place, he said, you go and see if the window's open. If they can't open, you shall use your walking stick and guarantee that they will open the next day. <laughs> the next best thing to the grace of God is oxygen. Now, we spend most of us a third of every day in bed. How well oxygenated is that room? It should be well oxygenated. Indoor pollution is often worse than outdoor pollution. Most homes are more dangerous to their occupants than if they lived in a tent in the yard. Oxygen. Now something you may not have heard about. Your eyes are a good reflection of the health of your whole body. I began to have eye troubles when I was 16. I've reading, been reading from hours a, hours a day from the age of nine. I'm grateful I didn't start before because the eyes are not fully mature till about eight, nine and ten. When people do it a lot earlier, as the Japanese do, it guarantees they'll have early four eyes, glasses. So I began to have eye troubles at the age of 16, so I read books on reading. And I'll tell you what I found out. And this can be tremendously helpful to a preacher because no preacher is worth his salt unless he's studying several hours a day. And that can be very risky. The eye is only at rest seven yards away. Anything you're looking at closer than seven yards, the eye is under tension. And soon things harden up. I found when I was entering my 70s, I had to get reading glasses. I could read without them but it was better with them. Most people go into reading glasses about 40 because they have violated this law. They have not changed focus often enough. And in our days of computers, we're going to see little kids going into glasses years earlier than they ought to. The rule is you must change focus every few paragraphs or every half minute Whenever I work in universities, and I've spent hundreds of hours in universities, I select a section in the library where I can look out of the window. And then every half minute or so, I lift my head from the book, I focus on a bird or a tree, and then I come back to my work. I have that, done that now for 60 years. And I pass it on to you as something that's worth a fortune. We'll collect it at the door. <laughs> eyes, eyes. You must change focus regularly, constantly. Otherwise, you'll have more and more trouble with sight and that can trigger other troubles. Eyes that must be protected. Right, we've talked a little bit about vitality, making sure you're rested, making sure you haven't eaten a heavy meal before you preach, but most of all your health, how you eat, how you exercise, how you rest, how you oxygenate, get enough air, how you care for your eyes, all that is of tremendous importance. Now we should ask the question, for how long should a man preach? There is a saying that the preacher must stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard and sit down to be loved. <laughs> is that the whole truth? I'll tell you the whole truth in a nutshell. You must leave your audience longing but not loathing. I have sometimes preached and people have come up to me and rebuked me. I said, look, we've travelled 200 miles to get here. You've only spoken for 30 minutes. And they give me a hard time. And they're right. You must leave them longing, not loathing. Now, it's not that bad if they take out their watch and look at it, but if they keep shaking it, that's a very bad sign. 
that's, that's a very bad sign. What many preachers deserve, what they really deserve is they should be forced to listen to their own sermons. They would cry out like Cain. This is a punishment greater than I can bear if they're forced to hear their own sermons. They say about Charles II, he was an unconscionable time dying. Well, some sermons are like that. Your sermon must not be an unconscionable time dying. You leave them longing rather than loathing. And if you see that people in the audience are falling asleep, that's a pretty good hint. So beforehand you should have told the usher, if anyone is falling asleep in the audience, get a long stick and prod the preacher. (laughs) Now let me tell you something that's more important than anything else. If you're very smart, very erudite, you can inform your audience. If you're very eloquent, you can attract your audience. But only if you pray much can you affect your audience. For a preacher to hope to convert people by his sermon is like thinking that an umbrella is very helpful in a tornado. Unless the Spirit of God condescends to speak through the preacher, no one will have lasting help. So remember, you may be erudite and inform your audience. You may be eloquent and attract your audience. But only if you're prayerful can you affect your audience. God bless you. All the best in your preaching without notes. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.